Hello, everyone. My name is Lane Little, and I am the director of the Polly Friedman Art Gallery at Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania. That's in Northeast Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking to the artists for our show, Compulsory Measures, which is on display in the gallery until October 18. We have a large series of events for you, so please do check our website at misericordia.edu slash art. We are also on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, this series was made possible by a National Endowment of the Humanities Cares Grant, and we thank the university for supporting our online programming in these interesting times. In this episode, we are going to be talking to Tanya Softich, whose work is right behind me here at the galleries. Tanya works in printmaking, drawing, photography, and the book arts. Her 2016 series, Gathered from Available Data, uses acrylic, chalk, charcoal, and collage on paper and board. And Tanya is currently on faculty at the University of Richmond. We're going to be um, getting her to talk to us a little bit about her process. And if you have any questions, please use the chat for function or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Thanks so much. And please tell us about your work, Tanya. Hey, uh, well, since you've asked me to talk about my process a little bit, I'll just talk a little bit about materials that are important to me. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about concepts in my work, because I'm one of those people that has to do something with her hands in order to think. That's why I'm an artist. Not every artist works that way, obviously. But um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, how um, I my images have come to be the way they are as the work that's now at Misericordia Gallery is fairly emblematic of my work of the past dozen years or so. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start the PowerPoint presentation in a minute. Okay, I'm starting with an image from a series called The Migrant Universe. And just like in the pieces that are in the show, um, this is a work on paper and paper, uh, Asian paper, Japanese paper, um, and paper that has been mounted on the wooden board. And um, I often work with paper mounted on the wooden board um, um, one reason is to avoid the framing because, you know, once you put the glass or plexiglass in front, uh, which you have to do with the works of paper, obviously, it does something for that work. And um, um, <clears throat> in Asian traditions, paper is often mounted on things like textile or wood. Um, and not displayed behind uh, the glass. So I sort of adopted this uh, way of treating the works on paper that is not so precious, that's a little bit more portable and practical. Um, and also I do that for simple reason, because once it's mounted on wood, and I should say that I'm not just mounting it right on the wood the board is made from that uh, that wood is gessoed and sanded a couple of times so that it's very very smooth uh, like a beautiful plaster wall like and um, because paper is wet when I'm mounting it it stretches a little bit and it really presses itself in, into that gesso so there's a luminosity that it gains from <clears throat> all that whiteness and it feels wonderful if any of you listening have ever been drawing on the litho lithographic stone um, it's there's no there's no nicer sensation than you know drawing with a crayon on it and that is something that I feel happens in this work on paper in in these uh, mounted uh, works of paper on mine um, the other thing is that the work is very layered and um, there's a lot going on uh, in, in this work and um, there are a lot of different means of working. I work with a stencil, I work, um, people usually see something like this, like this piece, um, 
the map of what happened, by the way, is the title and the size of the piece is five feet by 10 feet. So it's rather large, a little bit larger than the pieces in the show. People ask me, oh, you know, you have printed elements. It looks like you have printed elements in it. And I actually don't, you know, these are all done, <clears throat> entered into the space by hand, if you will. But I understand why people are asking me that. It makes complete sense because I think like a printmaker. I think, um, um, I think about objects, you know, I think about this thing, you know, you can switch between kind of drawn and very articulated objects like that bowl, for example, there are plenty of bowls and the pieces at your gallery now, um, or they can exist almost as these shadows, um, you know, that can be, uh, that, uh, that that kind of painted in and the sort of a very flat way, you know, not having any brushwork personality. So they do appear like shadows, you know, they, 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 their function is to obscure things behind them and highlight things in front of them more than call attention to themselves. <clears throat> So a great deal of my work, you know, is <clears throat> explores the idea of memory in the widest possible sense. You know, we talk about memory, if you think about it, we talk about uh, the memory of the materials as in memory foam, we're talking about human memory, we are talking about civilizational memory, we are uh, talking about hysteric, uh, hysterical memory. Well, th there's a category. Um, uh, historical um, uh, memory and such. And what I'm particularly interested in is memory as this complex interaction between text and image, which is really basis for what Romans called the uh, um, art of memory, which was part of the art of oratory, as Cicero left behind in his treatise um, on oratory. And um, because there was no paper in Roman times, because these people, this is a painting of the Senate, you know, it's an 18th century idea what the Senate looked like. Sorry, I have to let the cat in. Um, otherwise, he will be scratching. Apologies. I'm at home studio. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, because, you know, these speeches, you know, in Senate, this is the 18th century painting that depicts the Roman Senate as it likely looked were very long. They were sometimes hours and hours, five, six hours long. And there was this need to memorize them without having a text handy to uh, speak from. Um, and the way the speech was memorized is that orators were taught to imagine entering a building, like a residential building. Um, and of course, Roman residential architecture is centered around the atrium and you walk around the atrium in order to enter and exit rooms. So a speaker is to walk around this greater idea they're talking about, the atrium, and then entering the rooms, observing these elaborate still lives, the tableau vivants, or something that they have set up for themselves there to memorize visually, that will then trigger the ideas that they are talking about, sometimes very abstract ideas. And that orator, as they go through their speech, they walk into these uh, rooms, exit, enter another one, exit, and that's seemed a lot to me like, oh, this is how electricity travels through the, you know, through the memory chips, you know, in the computers, enters, exits, you know, uh, collects data, uh, whatnot. Um, so there's that kind of a memory, you know, connection. So this made a great deal of sense to me. Um, and uh, this, this kind of a very visceral 
you know, what is more visceral than trying to grabbing for any tool you have around in order to capture uh, a word that you need, a phrase that you need. That's in a way how you learn foreign languages. I remember memorizing words in English or some other um, language I was studying. Um, so uh, that to me uh, made a great deal of sense. And a lot of my work comments on both the persistence and fragility of memory and the fact that it's a, it's a made thing. It is not something that we are just given and then carry on in some kind of objective way. We don't. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the, the, the art of visual memory has been used a great deal. This is, these are the Jada panels from Scrovani Chapel. And this is, these are the images of, uh, from the panels depicting virtues and vices. And there is charity on one end and there is a greed on the other one. And I don't have to explain to anybody who's the charity and who's the greed, even though, okay, there are, there are inscriptions up there. Uh, according to Cicero, things that need to be memorized have to be strikingly beautiful or strikingly ugly. And um, so look at the charity, look at how beautiful she is as she's offering Look, she's offering out the bowl of fruit. She's standing on the bags of money. Um, and, <clears throat> and she's getting more from God <laughs> you know, up there. And then look at the greed and how ugly she is and how snake bites her and how, her, how she has this ugly gesture and his, she's clutching the bag of money and she's burning. Um, and she's destroying herself with her greed. So... Um, so this is something, this school of, you know, th this is the Bible of the poor. This is for people who did not read or write. How do you teach values? Um, how do you teach the values of the Bible through the image? So um, that is something that continues to fascinate me, having to come up with the concrete images for something very abstract. I'm also an immigrant from US. Um, I immigrated in 89, didn't, not knowing I'm immigrating for good. Um, I came to graduate school and by the time I was done, the war has started in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in former Yugoslavia. And my native city, Sarajevo was besieged and there was no place to go back. And, um, so that before and after is something that my work is very much about. You know, uh, <clears throat> this piece that you're looking at, it is also about 10 feet long. It's, it's um, narrower. <clears throat> and it's a piece um, that, that I made um, in Edward Said's uh, honor when he died. Um, Edward Said, of course, was a well-known literary critic and uh, kind of a public intellectual. He was Palestinian. He lived in, um, he, he taught at Columbia for a long time and wrote very beautifully about, um, uh, about he, he's in some ways a father of post-colonial studies sort of using the West's learning to kind of turn it against, the, you know, turn it uh, against <clears throat> itself, if you will. And uh, so he wrote a great deal about uproot, sense of being uprooted, sense of your life being jumbled in a way, sense of um, kind of having this layered consciousness. Um, if you will, so that is what I'm working uh, with here. So this is literally the root, the shape, kind of the main dominating shape you see is the Nandina root that I uprooted. I was moving bush from one end of the garden to another one and I lifted it up and this is how it looked and it had this kind of a right eloquent uh, choreography, if you will. Um, so I used it. Um, and, you know, other images of 
trying to contain, trying to keep, um, uh, kind of feeling a little afloat in this uh, world. And then the third one is the massive losses of memory that the world has been experiencing and, you know, with proliferation of more and more powerful weapons um, is seeing it on a great scale. What you are looking at here is burning of Sarajevo's library. This was a national um, library of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this is country's equivalent to Library of Congress. So in the summer of 93, for no good military reason, um, just because uh, the Serbian separatists who have encircled the <clears throat> city of Sarajevo started shelling <clears throat> the library. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, there was no uh, there was no water in the city, you know, there were no, I mean, functioning firefighting and so on. The city was already under siege for a number of months. And, um, and of course, it has burned to the ground with, you know, everything, most, not, not quite everything, but most everything in it. Miraculously, some stuff did get saved. Um, but, uh, you know, so when things like that happen, we have lost Aleppo. Um, in Syria, the city that is that whose culture holds the key to the cultural, musical, in particular, connections between the, among the three Abrahamic religions. You know, we have lost Bamiyan uh, Buddhas. We have lost and lost and lost in in the, and it. Um, and I'm really wondering what all of those, like the rest of us, what all those losses are going to amount to. And, you know, another one of my great influences, I'm just going to sh show his work, is a painter, German painter, Sigmar Polke, who was an Eastern, uh, Eastern German at the time when Germany was uh, divided during the Cold War. Um, and he painted on these vinyl covers for the tables. They're very popular in Eastern Europe and in Asia, you know, and they usually have these, you know, I don't know, flowery or decorative things printed them and you can just wipe them clean. You don't have to wash them, right? So they're very practical. <clears throat> and so he, he would stretch these things and paint on them. And I remember seeing this painting once and thinking, wow, he takes something that has so much content. What can have more content than kitchen table, vinyl cover? Um, and um, it says so much about culture. It has so, tells so much about sort of vernacular culture at the time. And then he adds images on, he, will, he would often silk screen um, here you can see the engraving. This, by the way, is called the death of Paganini. Uh, here in the middle of the image, you can see Paganini, who was kind of a lush, and he was always pursued by um, Jesuits. Um, so, and he was accused of being um, Satanist, you know, and even his great playing of the violin was held up against him as an evidence that, you know, he had something to do with the Satan and whatnot. But anyway, he did die of syphilis because, um, um, and uh, so here he is on his deathbed and the devil is playing the violin um, for him. So um, he was an artist who sort of set me free, gave me permission to do things and put them together and not know whether they at all make sense or that they will ever make sense again, because he kind of painted in that fearless way. And as I mentioned before, printmaking to me is itself as a metaphor. Um, here I am, I'm super dyslexic in this left and right uh, fashion. I'm one of those people that cannot say what is left and what is right. 
before I look at my hands and do a little mnemonics that people uh, like me do, um, I will, um, you know, I will sometimes have trouble with mirror images and stuff. And why have I chosen to be a printmaker is a mystery to me because printmaking is all about mirroring, right? So to me, you know, that kind of a labor of printmaking, that mental labor I have to undergo to kind of really see my image is one of those worth it things. Um, because that kind of a difficulty is almost like, you know, that that's piece of sand in the shell that makes a pearl. The shell has to be irritated first. The, the, you know, so it's, there needs to be some kind of a rub. The other thing about printmaking, and this is where Star Trek comes in, is that if you are making a color print, you will uh, make it from several plates, and then in the process of printing registration, meaning lining up of those plates, you're going to line them up, and uh, and they, they will come together. So in a way, you have to kind of disassemble your print like those, like those, uh, how do you call it? Um, um, those, uh, you know, those images in manuals of the, of the, like, I don't know, exploded view of your blender or something. Okay, I love those. I never, I, I never really read instructions on how to use the appliances, but I do look for their exploded image because it's a wonderful image to me. So, I'm a moderate fan of Star Trek. I'm not totally crazy but uh, about it. But you know that machine, the teletransporter that they have, that they kind of go in and then bzz, thing happens and then they show up somewhere where they're supposed to be and then when they're ready to go back, bzz, you know, they're back in the teletransporter. I don't know about you and I haven't seen all the episodes, but I have never seen one where they actually this thing does what it's supposed to do, you know, meaning get them somewhere and then get them back, no problem. Uh, something always happens. And what I'm interested in is what's happening to them, what kind of form they are when they're in that kind of plasmatic state when they're disassembled. So that's what printmaking is to me, sort of to put it in the most concise way. So I'm going to walk you through the process. And this also sort of shows you, um, in a way, how I build my images on paper as well. So here you see the layer, layer number one from one plate going on. Um, this, is the <clears throat> this is a print in the process of printing that's layered over the, um, over the uh, press. I apologize, I have terrible allergies at this time of year, so um, <clears throat> my throat is not uh, the happiest. So this is the second layer. Um, here is the third one. By the way, this is my collaborator, Kat, printmaker Kathy Caraccio, that I'm sometimes lucky to print editions with. I've done that as uh, her printer in New York back when I was much younger. And sometimes I'm lucky to be able to bring her down to University of Richmond where we sort of work together. <clears throat> and then here's some of that, <clears throat> here's more of the Migrant Universe series. So I'm, I'm showing you this gallery picture, you know, for the sake, for the sake of scale and um, my, my, all of my degrees, by the way, are in painting. I don't have any degrees. I don't have anything more than one intro class in terms of my printmaking education. So, you know, the, working for Kathy in New York has been my graduate school in printmaking, if you will. So, I, you know, my prints tend to be a, li a little bit large often. My... Um, uh, paintings or drawings, however you want to call these, you know, also tend to be um, fairly large. And something that I promised myself I'm going to do is 
give a viewer something to look at from afar and give a viewer something to look at close up. And, um, and uh, because when I first came to US, and what I'm going to say now is completely unfair. I will, I will, I will preface it with that. I came to US and first opportunity I had, I ran to New York and I ran to MoMA to look at the paintings by my idols, um, uh, uh, Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock and uh, Franz Klein and, and Motherwell and Helen Frankenthaler. And I did, and I ran up and I felt like, I felt so crestfallen because I came up to their pieces and I was like, that's it. Nothing's happening to me when I'm really close up to them. They're not speaking to me. This just looks like a really thinned out oil paint pouring down the canvas. Weren't they thinking about the surfaces? And I prefaced this with saying that this is completely unfair and I was entirely unfair. I came from the culture that is very interested and in very close up, how shall I say it, ornamenting things and like uh, sort of almost like this needlework of surface. And, um, and I didn't know that at the time, but what was working on my own aesthetic setup was also sitting next to my grandmother as she was crocheting and adding those little circles together. And only later when I looked at them, I realized, oh my God, my grandmother was knitting mid-century modern, uh, crocheting mid-century modern table covers. You know, they were not, they didn't look Victorian or, you know, uh, Austro-Hungarian or anything. They looked modern but they were, because that's what she was looking at at the time, <laughs> but she uh, was making them. But you know, that also imprinted itself, that kind of a handy work, that kind of a need to do something carefully and intensively. I guess this is where compulsive measures come in for me. And that was absolutely not an objective of abstract expressionists and color field painters, right? Um, you know, the, Agnes Martin came close, but at that time I didn't even know about Agnes Martin. Um, so I, I had to unlearn my love for the abstract expressionism and then later on make friends uh, on different terms, not on these impossible terms, right? So uh, this is one of the pieces, it's, it's very related to the pieces that, you know, are in your, um, that are in your exhibit. And that is that, in, in a sense that everything is in motion and everything is kind of either flying in or flying out or unknown. Um, because, you know, it, it, it's, it's on a way toward you or away from you and you know, Baroque painting is, uh, uh, has always been an influence and that kind of emotion, you know, in it. Um, but, you know, basically, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to do works that had to do with basically the world, the universe, if you will, coming at you in this, um, uh, when it is ready, not when you are ready, <laughs> if you will. So uh, that is what is happening in a lot of these pieces. Um, I'm sorry, I should probably stop and maybe um, give you a chance to take this conversation in a different direction or... And I, I am loving all of this, especially the um, discussion about the architecture of memory is something that uh, oh. I, I started with as a, I started as a pol political science major. And so those kinds of thinking processes were part of my academic training. 
Um, would course. you be interested in hearing some of the student responses to your work? Um, I would love to. Mm -hmm. And I would just also like to, right before that, I would also yeah. like to say that I, I'm also a professor at the Liberal Arts University. And it's, um, it's a rich environment to be in. And I have had a lot of people in different disciplines to talk to about these things. And um, that too, I should have said, is a big influence on my work. But anyway, let's hear what students Wonderful. Are. So yeah, so we, my students are not art majors. Uh, most mm -hmm. of them have no background in the arts. And um, so the first exercise we do is visual analysis. They, the, the class is called subjects and symbols. So they're looking about at ways to represent big ideas. So one of the students that looked at your work said that, uh, that your use of scale mm -hmm. was, helped him to understand your universe better because he saw the different sizes as giving the work, which is very flat, a sense of space. So you could go into the painting, you go out of the painting because you, you have these different identical, mm -hmm. uh, identical objects of different sizes floating around. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing he said, and, and he, there, some of my students are a little bit intellectually brave, I think. So he said that he thought that perhaps the use of the satellites was mocking uh, modern technology because he said that we invest so much time and energy into replicating things that naturally occur already. Reinventing. <laughs> Don't you love liberal arts majors? <laughs> you know, I just love uh, being in that environment. I love teaching classes like that, you know. Um, you know, when I'm a visiting artist and uh, at the larger programs with the graduate school, it's wonderful that to get immersed with, you know, art major world and so on. But then I come back and I realize, whoa, my students are looking at all of this from kind of all kinds of different perspectives from sort of a, and, and you know, that is so valuable. You know, that is so valuable to bring those two things together. Um, yes, scale is, I just, I mentioned earlier Baroque painting. Um, the, you know, if, if you look at the Baroque ceilings, um, like, I don't know, by Borromini or something, those great Roman uh, Jesuit churches, I mean, the figures are literally, they're, they're, of course, it's the, it's all trompe l'oeil, it's all, um, tr you know, visual trickery. Figures look like they're literally falling on you out of that ceiling, and then you will see somebody's tiny foot somewhere up there, and they're disappearing into cloud, you know, or something like that. It is so powerful to... Um, you know, it, it's like in writing... Uh, when you're writing a paper, if all of your sentences are of the same length, it's just going to be dull, no matter how, what good, you know, when you start playing with the length of your sentence and kind of your sentence, you start creating some contrast and some music, right, in it. And um, so similarly, you know, of course, positioning things and so on. It's, it's very funny how we... Um, uh, as artists always go back to these very first little lessons of composition that we talk about in our intro classes, you know, because those really are foundations that stay with us in our art making, you know, forever. But that's very insightful. Yeah. And his second uh, comment about mocking. Um, yeah, it's, you know, um, my works are not essays. My works are poems. And what that means, among other things, is that I am going to trust images. I am going to trust poetry itself to get me across that river of comprehension of, you know, somebody connecting to my work. Uh, you know, in essay, you try to make your point clearly, 
right? Um, I am more of a poet than an essayist, I would say, in my work. As much as I love essay, there's nothing like a good essay, but, um, you know, I, uh, like I said, you know, when I was showing Sigmar Polka's work, he's great in that way. It's like, let it loose a little bit. You, you don't have to tie everything together. Let the problem kind of, let, let it marinate a little, work on something else, you know, see what happens out of that. Uh, it's not very different from composing a paper for political science class or something. You do it, some things work, some don't, you return and return and return to it until they do, so. It's interesting, Tanya, that you were talking about poetry because I've been taking notes as you've been speaking and a while back I wrote down visual poems uh, <laughs> and I was responding to you. Too. Yeah, yeah, which means that, you know, oh, uh, g getting back to the question, the, 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 the thing, am I mocking something with, um, hmm, mocking was not in my mind, but I can see why, you know, I, I see and I am enriched by that, uh, hearing um, that sort of a comment. The piece was a little bit about um, surveillance and um, kind of, omnipresence and kind of the sort of a uh, on one hand horrifying on the other hand almost comical thing you know people are there we have lots of conversations about surveillance and um you know and about control and uh, is government watching you or something like that and uh, you know usually same people who complain are people who are readily giving their credit card numbers and stuff you know, online and posting on social media. So I don't know what the big, uh, but you know, there's, there's on one hand comical concern, you know, comical over concern about, on the other hand, we're thinking about what is this really doing to our minds, this life on camera constantly. She said on camera. So. <laughs> And can you tell us what you're working on now and what's in the future? Or um, one of the other things that we were interested in is how has this been affecting everyone? Here are, some of the, here are some of the pieces I'm working on. Actually, let me show you my drawing table. It is occupied by my critic right now. Uh, but um, what I'm doing right now, at the moment, I'm the chair of the Art and Art History Department at U of R. Uh, during the COVID year, which means that I've had no summer <laughs> whatsoever. And um, I'm, I'm in the sort of, a, I'm wearing this administrative head on me, but uh, so that I don't completely shrivel up and die as an artist, um, I'm working on these very small, um, I, I, I was in Japan and I got some of this beautiful paper back, these small pieces of Oh, about seven by seven inches paper. So I'm doing these collages and drawings and the assignment was do one a day. Don't be too hard of yourself. When you start saying, oh, maybe oh, this is not good. Just stop thinking, just continue working. And some of them will be work and many of them will not. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up for a sabbatical next year. And um and I'm going to travel back to Sarajevo to do some research and um, and start from there. I'm going to throw this to you, Renny. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, I, I just have one question about um, the way you work, um, Tanya. Mm -hmm. Do you work with a preconceived um, schematic? in your head or is this evolve more intuitively and as you go you adjust and move things around um sometimes i mean i do both at times as you well know print is something that has to be somewhat more planned ahead right right um and for these larger pieces you know there is a thumbnail sketch and it evolves into some kind of a sketch. 
and then it evolves into some kind of collage. And, um, and uh, sometimes I look at them and I see the clear connections between them. Oh, you know, here's how my, and sometimes I look at it and I think, what the heck and how did I come, I, you know, things just change, you know, and, uh, um, you know, peace almost forces your hand. And that is, you know, uh, that is when I feel my work is at my at most successful, when I kind of depart from, you know, I have good earnest um, intention, I have a plan, but if something happens, some kind of a disruption in the process uh, that makes me, okay, now I have to do total realignment of everything, that's when I'm happiest. Uh, that's when I know I'm, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say happiest, you know, that's when I know um, I'm really working because the piece is almost working on me, right. if you will. No, that makes sense. Wonderful. Well, we are running uh, about the end of our program. Um, do you have anything you want to add to our viewers and listeners? Um, I'd like to tell to students, you know, if, if they're engaged in their own artwork, to be patient with themselves. Mm -hmm. You are not supposed to get phenomenal at whatever you're doing, despite all the stories about wunderkinds who have opened their companies at the age of 16 and stuff. <laughs> um, despite what it looks like everywhere on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and anywhere, it's a slow process and don't forget to enjoy and observe that process. Um, and um, anyway, everybody stay healthy and wear them masks. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us on this video. Thank you so much to Tanya and to our uh, curator of the show, Rini Gower. And we would like you to join us for the group roundtable, which is on Thursday, September 24 at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Go to our Eventbrite page or our uh, Facebook or Instagram to find out more about that. Also, if you're interested in the entire catalog, it's available as a downloadable PDF from blurb.com, and we'll put that address on our media as well. Thank you so much, and um, thank you also to the National Endowment for Humanities for providing funding for this effort. Thanks so much.